Hi, I'm Jake. And I am Marlin. AKA Gee. But he always introduces himself as Marlin. Welcome to, as of when this video goes up, the 40th anniversary of the Blues Brothers. Two men with a mission and only 11 days. Are you the police? No, ma'am. We're musicians. The Blues Brothers is one of those films that just morphs all types of genres, comedy, music, action, and is heralded for being successful in all three and... I first saw it about 10 years ago and loved it the first time. I think uh, you pushed me to watch it. And um, you, you're, uh, I think you saw it way before that. Uh, oh, yeah, definitely. You were be about uh, 33 when it uh, came out in theaters. Did you uh, yeah, see th then? Me and Dan Aykroyd were much younger men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, crazy to think. Dan Aykroyd was only in his late 20s when he made this film. I'll have some. Toasted white bread, please. You want butter or jam on that toast, honey? No, ma'am. Dry. The Blues Brothers was the first major film that Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi did after parting from SNL. They had done a year before the Steven Spielberg movie, 1941, but they weren't a team in that film. In fact, they only had one uh, scene that lasted a couple of seconds together. This was the first of Surprisingly, only two films where they played a team. They were a hit on SNL, and that's where the Blues Brothers originated. Just as a sketch, showing them performing their love of the blues. After the success of Animal House, people wanted John Belushi in more movies, and him and Dan Aykroyd just worked so well together that they brought the vision of the Blues Brothers to the big screen. For directors, they got John Landis, who had previously directed Belushi in Animal House, so he knew how to sort of handle him. Uh, how to set him loose. More or less. Dan Aykroyd had never written a real screenplay before, so his original script was apparently 324 pages. Kind of thinned that down a little, yeah. And did not play out like a real script. Mm -hmm. As a joke, he sent it in uh, with a phone book cover over it. And then John Landis was brought in to edit it into a workable format, <laughs> which apparently took him only two weeks. Okay, that's great. So that means that uh, Elwood had given him something good to work with. This guy is unfucking believable The Blues Brothers are Joliet, Jake Blues, and Elwood Blues. Two brothers who grew up in a Catholic orphanage and at one point had a band called the Blues Brothers Band. Jake at some point went to prison and the film opens with him getting early release, reuniting with his brother and revisiting the orphanage where they grew up, where they meet the head nun who raised them, who they call the Penguin. She tells them that the orphanage is about to shut down unless it can get $5,000 and... To pay city taxes. They offer to get it in their traditional, uh, criminal way. I will not take your filthy stolen money! But she refuses to take that. So after having a talk with a friend and person who looked after them, Curtis, played by Cab Cowling. They go to a church, mostly under pressure, to seek some enlightenment. And it's there that it's heavily implied that Jake is given a message from God to reform the Blues Brothers band, put on a concert, and raise the money. Have you seen the light? Jesus H. Goddamn Christ! I have seen the light! And they only have less than two weeks to get this done, so the whole film is just a big, long adventure of them seeking out their former bandmates who are spread out all over the state of Illinois, and then make their way to Chicago to pay off the taxes. Sounds simple enough. 
That's a great plan. Fucking ingenious, if I understand it correctly. It's and from there, they encounter all types of people, ranging from uh, scorned uh, ex-fiancés and Illinois Nazis. <laughs> Pretty much uh, wrecking havoc on anyone who's unfortunate enough to get in their way. <laughs> yes, they seem to be, uh, what was the saying? It's a mission from God. We're on a mission from God. We're on a mission from God. They're not gonna catch us. We're on a mission from God. Elwood keeps saying that, like, that excuses everything they're doing. <laughs> We're on a mission from God. Don't you blaspheme in here! Don't you blaspheme in here! The characters of Jake and Elwood Blues, um, they're really interesting. They're funny. Yes, in, the, in their own uh, seedy, criminal way. As far as being criminals go, like Jake was in prison, fly that he held up a store. The best way to put it is, they're bad, but they're not the worst. Their crimes, uh, for the most part, a lot of what they do is, I guess, for the greater good. But occasionally they just take stuff because it's like a compulsion. They just have to do something. Yes, they are uh, they are criminals. But the way this whole movie is written, it's okay because nobody actually gets killed in this movie, or at least that you can see it. Yeah, little uh, debatable if certain people might have gotten it. Yes, I mean, the outcome of the fall out of the sky would probably mean death, but <laughs> you don't see it. Jake is, uh, surprisingly one of, even though he has a few drunken moments, the character of Jake Blues is one of John Belushi, who is known for being the wild party man. I'd say it's actually one of his more subdued roles. I don't think I would call that role subdued. The only scene where he really acts crazy, in my opinion, is when they're at the restaurant. In that case, they're deliberately trying to act crazy to cause a scene. To embarrass a former band member to give up his very well-paying job as a maitre d' in a wonderful restaurant and come back to well, the Blues Brothers. Well, bit of a snob fest, but yeah. And Dan Aykroyd as Elwood, he's definitely the straight man of the group. Unlike some of his other roles, Elwood's not like a, as far as I can tell, a fast talker like Dan Aykroyd does in many of his movies. Anything that can be screwed or glued to that car or truck of yours, come see old Ray. Hey, you want a guarantee? I got a guarantee stamped on every box. Jake is definitely uh, the bad boy of the group. Elwood, um, well, he is still a criminal, has a bit more of a... It's a, it's a supporting character. <laughs> well, he has a bit more of a level head in mo more scenes than Jake. Even though, yeah, they are both breaking the law many times. <laughs> Not to mention his driving. Mm -hmm. This won't be a traditional review where we go through the whole film. We're mainly going to talk about, first of all, how the film means so much to us. I love the Blues Brothers. It is a film I can watch over and over and always feel great while watching it. Mm -hmm. It makes me laugh, the music just gets me moving, and the, the action sequences are some of the most well done car chases and just full of so much uh, adrenaline. It actually creates a good deal of suspense. Yes indeed, the car chases. But every, it's almost like it's a series of skits. There's a storyline, you know, all of that, and you know, dust and so, but it, it's like a series of really outrageous SNL skits in some ways. It's a lot it's a lot of fun. Well that makes sense. It's originated from an SNL sketch. The whole film I said it's like an adventure, almost an odyssey of sorts. It almost feels like a two week journey with these guys. It's fun. But as far as the the comedy thing go, um, the Blues Brothers. They have their names written on their fingers. Tattooed. <laughs> Jake, J A K E. And then Dan Aykroyd's is L W D <laughs> on two fingers of the other hand. And uh, just, just silly things like that. Thug life. Or the uh, car chase where they're going through the mall. They're just tearing the thing apart, but the dialogue between them is it's so oh. casual. New Oldsmobiles are in early this year. 
and they're just leaving this wake of uh, Dest destruction in yeah. behind. And what's the reason for the car chase? Uh, they get pulled over and Elwood's license, yeah. The cops run it through and... Suspended. Once the car chase in the mall starts, it almost becomes a different type of movie for a few minutes. Big cars destroying a lot of stuff inside with a lot of scared uh, uh, shoppers <laughs> going every which way they can. They broke my watch! What was your favorite uh, comedic scene in the film, if you haven't already mentioned it? Oh, boy. It, it, there, were, there were so many. Um, it would be very difficult to, to come up with, so probably the most outrageous one was in the restaurant when they're trying to embarrass the horn player, now a Mater D, to leave his job, and he makes wants to make a bid on the, the patron's child and on his wife. <laughs> How much? Your women, I, I, I want to buy your women, the little girl, your daughters. Sell them to me. Sell me your children. <laughs> Mater D, you. How much for your wife? <laughs> <laughs> Only real time you see Belushi go full Bluto in this movie. Just craziness. I actually think that's my favorite comedic scene too. Just uh, seeing them in this place where they clearly don't belong. Acting uh, childish and making a scene. And I don't know, something about restaurants and people eating food always appeals to me. Little touches. Um, like the, little... the glass, the champagne glass and the layers like wrong glass sir and the guy's like just poor and i'm not sure how people might notice this but the waiter that takes their champagne order is played by a pre peewee herman paul rubens <laughs> five shrimp cocktails and some bread for my brother we have a don perignon 71 at 120 dollars that'll be fine pal that's peewee herman yes sir he's been a little up and down in his career i understand so in more ways than one. I think. But yeah, we get another hilarious restaurant scene where they go to get their old guitar player, Matt Murphy, pretty much playing himself. Playing himself as now married to Aretha Franklin. And they go in and make their order. Four fried chickens and a Coke. You want chicken wings or chicken legs? Four fried chickens and a Coke. And for some reason, the only thing Elwood ever seems to eat is white bread. You want butter or jam on that toast, honey? No, ma'am. Dry. Yes. With no liquid. <laughs> well, he did sip the champagne in one scene. There you go. But yeah, he never really orders anything to drink. Maybe that's why Dan Aykroyd was so thin back in the day. <laughs> the tall one wants white bread toast with nothing on it. Elwood. And another really hilarious part of the film is this mystery woman who keeps appearing throughout the film, played by, at the same year that Empire Strikes Back came out, Carrie Fisher. We see her appear three or four times throughout the film, constantly trying to kill Jake and Elwood. First time, she's just sitting in her car and almost casually picks up a rocket launcher. And next time, she blows up the building they're in, which that's the one part where it's unclear if anyone survived, aside from who we saw get out of the rubble. Yeah. It, but it, damn. <laughs> it was an impressive explosion. They brought the building down. And then we see her appear with a flamethrower, which sends them flying into the air inside of a payphone. And a running gag that never ceases to make me laugh is how after all these uh, explosions, all these near-death experiences, Jake and Elwood just rub it off and just move on with their business like they're not even questioning what happened. There's got to be at least seven dollars worth of change here. And um, I think it's important, I, I don't think she really wanted to kill Elwood, but he was just there and she really wanted to kill Jake. I must now kill you. Your brother. What do you know about it? Nothing. And what's the reason for this mystery woman who doesn't appear to be connected to the main story? Turns out she's Jake's ex fiance who he left standing at the altar. I stood at the back of the cathedral waiting in celibacy for you with 300 friends and relatives in attendance. 
she's obsessed with killing him to uh, avenge her family's honor. And just what it seems like, she's gonna blow them away with a machine gun. I ran out of gas! I had a flat tire! I, I didn't have enough money for cab fare! Someone stole my car! There was an earthquake! Jake weasels his way out by putting on a sob show, and then, and the only time we ever see him without him, takes off his sunglasses, and, uh, Carrie just pretty much melts in front of him. <laughs> And after a quick kiss, just drops her and leaves. Let's go. Take it easy. Yes, no longer going to be killed, so away she goes. Move along. Move along. That scene with him taking off the glasses, I said that's the only time in the entire film that John Belushi is seen without his sunglasses. Dan Aykroyd, he never takes his sunglasses off in the film. There's one scene in the extended cut where he's wearing see-through glasses when he quits his job at the factory. Ah, yes. I'm going to become a priest. Well, okay. One last major comedy part of the film I want to talk about before we talk mostly about the music. In the middle of the film, another bit of randomness, but another new set of enemies they make. They are held up in traffic. They ask what's going on. Those bums won their court case, so they're marching today. What bums? The fucking Nazi party. I pledge allegiance to Adolf Hitler! leads to the most famous lines in the film, Illinois Nazis. I hate Illinois Nazis. And uh, they make pretty good uh, fools out of the Nazis. No! Ah! The lead Nazi is played by Henry Gibson, who puts in a pretty good, funny, but also easily hateable performance. A lot of people know him from Rowan and Martin's Laughing, where he played kind of uh, passive, small-time kind of characters, and so this was a different sort of uh, portrayal for him, and it, I think it worked well for the movie. Get that car's license plate number. We're gonna kill that son of a bitch. As a little kid, I saw him in this Disney Channel movie called The Luck of the Irish, where he played a leprechaun from Ireland, <laughs> and uh, I thought he was all right in that. Moving on to the music part of the film, this film has a pretty impressive collection of soul and blues and rhythm musicians. Yes, uh, a lot of acts like that. But in addition to that, the, the different soundtracks, not just the acts, but always going in the background. The music is a big part of this movie. It's just there, almost continuously. The first act of the film is the godfather of soul himself, James Brown playing a reverend and it's the scene with him singing the old landmark where everybody just uh, starts dancing that Jake and Elle would get their message from God and after proclaiming that he's seen the light <laughs> And then Elwood goes in. <laughs> the dancing from Aykroyd and Belushi, uh, you have your thoughts on Aykroyd. I, it's, it's just, it's almost a, a step in time thing he does. But it is, it is to the music, but it really does not look like rhythm and blues dancing. Whereas they had all the other, like the church members doing their thing. That looked like people that knew how to dance. <laughs> Aykroyd, and he, and he just did it in all the different times when he and, and by himself or with Jake were dancing, and it was hilarious. It was, it, was, <laughs> it was funny every time. And the one thing that strikes me is that the Blues Brothers, or at least Elwood, everything about him is black except a white shirt, and he wore white socks. <laughs> Where is the only place you see a white sock? John Belushi's dancing, on the other hand, while still kind of funny because he's a short, fat man, I think he's the superior dancer of the two. I guess cocaine probably played a factor in it. Yes, he was funny. He was funny throughout. John Belushi was 
But I knew El Elwood as a dancer was hilarious. Running in place. And then later, as they're on their way to find Matt Guitar Murphy, we see this little montage of the street they're on, in this black neighborhood, people selling records. We see a street musician played by John Lee Hooker. It feels more like a glorified cameo, because... Oh, it's, it was great. He yeah. doesn't get a big musical number, boom, 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 boom. but he does get to perform a song. How, 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 how. After he's finished, he talks about how he came up with it like a certain number of years ago, and then we hear someone scream, No you didn't! And when we cut back ten minutes later, a fight is broken out. That may be referenced back to some trouble he's had that way in the past, I don't know, but it was, it was funny in and of itself. And then they go into the soul food restaurant, where after their outrageous orders, they uh, reunite with Matt, and while they ask him to come, his wife is not so keen on him going. Which results in a tense moment where he's like, I'm the man, you're the woman, I'll make the decisions concerning my life. She says, think about the consequences of your actions. He's like, oh, shut up, woman, and then... And it was spectacular. It was great. Just you know, what pipes she has. And she's got, you know, the two or three of the females in the restaurant. They get up and, and they're doing the dance with. And all of a sudden, Jake and Elwood are on the end of the line doing the dance with. I mean, it's just small touches like that throughout the movie that uh, are just funny. She really was the queen of soul. And he leaves, and she's like, Shit. <laughs> that was the final comment from Aretha. Doesn't look like the blues business is a great place for the woman. Well, not in this film. <laughs> and after finally regathering all their old bandmates, they go to get new instruments. This little store called Ray's Music Exchange. And who's the owner? Ray motherfucking Charles. Pardon me, but we do have a strict policy concerning the handling of the instruments. An employee of Ray's Music Exchange must be present. Now, may I help you? He got into the role. He did that. It, it was spectacular again. Great music. And, but he was in the role as Ray, the blind proprietor. Even before he starts playing the piano, Ray's uh, putting on a good comedic performance, and <laughs> in one of the uh, most hilarious scenes you'll ever see, we see this little kid trying to steal a guitar, and then Ray just... Now go on, get it. it breaks my heart, boy, that young going bad. And the part where they ask about the piano, and he tells them, 2,000 bucks and it's yours. I can throw in the black keys for free. And Belushi says, 2,000 bucks for this chunk of shit? And Murph, their pianist, says, there's no action left in this piano. It's almost like they were uh, challenging uh, the master. Excuse me, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with the action on this piano. What I love about the Ray Charles sequence is when he's playing Shake a Tail Feather, we cut into the street where we see all these different people of all ages and races just start dancing to the song, doing all the moves as Ray says them, out in the middle of the street where they can't possibly hear the music in the store. Well, it was amplified. I like the thing that just shows that how powerful Ray's music is. It was great. It was, it was a great sequence. After that, they uh, embark on trying to find a gig, and Jake and Elwood don't got no gig, so they just go to the first place they spot, some uh, country, country western. 
well, I was going to say redneck hillbilly place, but okay. They go in and they lie saying that they're this band that's on the marquee, the good old boys. They're expected to perform a particular group of uh, country western songs. Hank Williams, which they don't know. They try to start out their act, which does not go over well with the crowd one bit. And then they fall back on... Rawhide. Rawhide. And then they sing uh, Stand By Your Man, which moves some of the patrons to tears. <laughs> Funny sequences, yes. And then, of course, they gotta get out of there. Why? When they ask about their pay, the owner says $200, which even for the 80s seems like a cheap uh, pay to give. Yes. He then says, and you drank $300 worth of beer. <laughs> Just as they're about to leave, that's when the actual good old boys arrive, and when they say we're really late, I'm like, no shit. <laughs> And the leader of the good old boys is played by Charles Napier, a classic character actor you find in films like Silence of the Lambs in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And uh, he plays a pretty threatening character. Yep, he doesn't want to take any crap from anybody. He finds out things are going wrong. So first thing he does is load up his gun. Our Lady of Plus Acceleration, don't fail me now! <laughs> and desperate to make a legit gig before the band conks out, they visit an old booking agent, played by Steve Lawrence, who is able to get them this place called the Palace Hotel Ballroom. And with only one day to get the word out, they travel all over the state. They have Curtis back at the orphanage, go to some places, handing out flyers. Leads to a funny gag of Ray putting one up in his store and then seeing it's upside down. Mind if I borrow one of these next week? I got a blind date. A blind date! <laughs> oh! And when it comes time for the show to actually start, Jake and Elwood are running behind. So, Curtis, played by Cab Calloway, holds the crowd over by performing with the Blues Brothers Band, Cab's old hit, Minnie the Moocher. He sang that song for decades. He sang it in the 30s, he sang it in the 40s, and he was singing it in the 50s. And it was, it was still good. The crowd loved it. For a 72-year-old man, he could really uh, belt it out. And he was the only guy that looked good in the same kind of clothes that Jake and Elwood had. <laughs> And what's interesting is when he starts singing, all of a sudden, everyone's outfits changed. And the first time I watched that, I found it a little confusing. And I think the reason the outfits change is it's meant to show, like, this is a good song. When they performed it, they're just kind of wearing average day clothes. But for this really good performance, the film decides to give them the look they deserve. And it was pretty much in the uh, the big band era kind of uh, get, get up for everything. Cab Calloway is no longer in a black suit. He's in a white tuxedo and it was just kind of almost a tribute to the music that he did and the way he did it back in the day. And finally, Jake and Elle would appear and they have a much more successful show than the one they had at the Country Bunker. As funny as Ackroyd's dancing is and as uh, wild as Belushi can get, I think you gotta give it to them. They have some pretty decent singing voices. Yes, they, they put on a good musical uh, presentation. They really did. You could tell they loved doing it. They loved doing it. It was good. Like I said, music background went throughout this whole movie, but here they're doing it in front of a crowd of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people who, are, who are really getting into the, 
the whole thing. So it was a great presentation. All the while, the law enforcement is there waiting for them to end. The main member in charge is played by John Candy. He only has a few minutes of screen time, but uh, he makes the best of it. Playing a authority figure, a little intimidating, but gets some pretty funny lines. Uh, we're in a truck! <laughs> After making a quick record deal, they get the money. After the quick run-in with Jake's ex, they set forth for Chicago, and then we get one of the best car chases you'll ever see. It started out pre-dawn, ended in daylight. 106 miles to Chicago, a full tank of gas, half a pack of cigarettes, it's dark, and we're wearing sunglasses. Hit it. And it's from here that we get what would be, for 18 years, the world record for the most amount of car crashes in a film. This film, according to what I've read, has 103 car crashes. Groovy. I believe it's through the extensive amount of crashes that this film went about $10 million over budget. The movie's budget was about $27 million in the <laughs> end. And I can see why, because, man, they really wrecked those cars all over Chicago. And they were very inventive about it. They wrecked them out on the freeway, they wrecked them as they went off the road, and then when they got into the city they had all kinds of different things that they could do with them. When we get the point of view from the front of the car, and like seeing it just speed by, almost hitting other cars and bicycle riders, well, the speedometer says it's going 118 miles an hour. It was really going that fast. The people on bikes were stuntmen trying to be in the right spot at the right time. <laughs> yes. Be in the right spot or you're going to be a spot, dude. Stunt drivers, they're going really fast. And after the big pile up where they're just coming and coming and flipping when it seems like there's nothing to flip them. And they just, they actually start firing their pistols from the wreck to try and get them. Yeah, it was a great chase scene, it really was. It just went on and on and on. Early on in the movie they did the, the car chase uh, with the cops in the mall. Tore the place up and, and that, that wasn't two minutes or something. They just went on and on and on. And it was just kind of setting you up for this is what would this is what was coming at the end. It was unprecedented. They crashed more white police cars in that movie than I'm surprised it wasn't more than a hundred. It was a huge number of cars. The Blues Mobile, which they call their particular car, an old uh, retired police car, does a lot of stunts that are realistically impossible. Yeah. There's a scene that was deleted, but later put into the extended release, where we see them hiding the car in a shed full of high-voltage electricity. Dan Aykroyd said that this was meant to be the reason for why the car is able to do what it can do, just that the electricity charged it. But John Landis, I mean, they put it in later, but at the time, he cut it because he thought, there doesn't need to be an explanation, just a magic car. Almost a magic car, but uh, it, it's an old cop car and it had a huge engine in it and could really fly. After a little run-in with the Nazis, resulting in, once again, it's hilarious because the way that car drops after going off a ramp, like, how high was that ramp? Well, the, the, the ramp was not nearly as high, but they, <laughs> they spent a lot of time dropping that car through the air, going it's, down into the city of Chicago. Yes. The impossibility that makes it hilarious. And then the side Nazis like, I've always loved you. They arrive at the Cook County Assessment's office. The ending is full, it's hilarious, but it's genuinely suspenseful. You're wondering, Will they get there in time? Because, and, and not in a bad way, they really drag the ending out, them getting up to the office, the cops, the National Guard, everybody shows up, and the way they're going after them, 
You'd swear they were domestic terrorists or something. Jake and Elwood arrive at the top, and Elwood disables the elevator. They quickly run to the office, and seems like they may not make it, because the guy is not there. But then the Cook County uh, assessor shows up, and they finally get the payment made. And just as they get their receipt... Don't shoot, or we'll be shooting ourselves. Well, they accomplished what they wanted to do. And, fun bit of trivia, the guy in the office is Steven Spielberg. No shit. And for anyone wondering why is Steven Spielberg playing this role, John Landis was good friends with Spielberg at the time, and it's John Landis' trademark to cast big-time directors in cameos in his films. In the 90s, when he made Beverly Hills Cop 3, he casted George Lucas in a pretty memorable scene. <laughs> And then the film ends with one final musical hoorah. Jake, Elwood, and I guess, considering, I guess the band is considered, uh... Accessories. Yeah. They're all in jail. They're now performing in the jail. And what song do they go out on? And they do a great version of Jailhouse Rock. And in between them singing and dancing, we get a quick shot of all of the main musical guests singing a lyric. We get a quick run through of the whole cast, and then... And then the film ends with the prisoners in the lunch hall dancing and the guards misinterpreted as a riot. So, yeah, even when they're not trying to cause trouble, Jake and Elwood are pretty much, uh... In the middle of it all, yes. A menace to society. <laughs> The Blues Brothers is a long, long, but really fun adventure. It has amazing music, pretty hilarious and not too over-the-top comedy, and some extremely well-done chase and action sequences. It blends these three particular genres that generally don't go together, but does them all extremely well and makes it a standout film in all three genres. It's a kind of good place to go and relax. You get a lot of taste of a lot of different things. We've gone on and gone here because we like it so much. If you haven't seen The Blues Brothers, see it. If you have seen it, see it again. You Especially to celebrate the 40th anniversary. Yes. Naturally. This film has lasted throughout the years. It never gets old. A new generation sees it every couple of years and I think if anyone is human, they will really like it. John Belushi, we didn't get him for very long, but he gave us some of the best comedy classics of the past 50 years. Dan Aykroyd, we all know what he went on to do. And John Landis, uh... Minus an unfortunate uh, helicopter crash, made some pretty good comedies after this. Good morning, my neighbors! Hey, fuck you! Yes, fuck you too! Hope you uh, enjoyed our pretty much uh, fangirling of the Blues Brothers. Just wanted to do a little celebration video. Bit of a ramble. We, we like the movie, can you tell? Love it very much. Thank you for watching, and I will see you again later, and hopefully have you back at some point. Maybe. Don't wait too long. <laughs>
One unused prophylactic, one soiled. 